So the first up will be uh, Katrina Schofield, and she's from Edinburgh Napier University. And the title of uh, Katrina's talk is How Digital Technology Can Help Literary Heritage Sites Evoke the Feeling of Reading. And uh, she's going to explore how digital technology might transform literary heritage sites and uh, why the digital is particularly suited to literary heritage sites despite its currently sparse usage. So if I could just invite um, Katrina to come on camera now, it'd be lovely to hear from you. Over to you, Katrina, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Katrina. I'm a young white woman with brown hair and I'm wearing a blue top and glasses today. So I'm currently doing a collaborative PhD in Edinburgh, looking at the way that digital technology can create new opportunities for literary heritage sites. So accordingly today, I'll be suggesting where digital technology can fit into literary heritage sites and how it can be used to create new opportunities to explore literature and reading itself. Um, for the purpose of keeping the speed talk speedy, I'm going to be focusing on British sites, but in my research, I am looking international too. Um, so yeah. Literary heritage sites in Britain today currently don't tend to use digital technology. Um, although there is innovation, there is definitely a standard form that literary heritage sites take, which is exemplified by the Writers' House Museum approach, like the examples you see pictured on the screen, which include Abbotsford um, and the Bronte Parsonage Museum. Um, Writers' House Museums are authentic feeling heritage sites recreated as it was when the author, who's generally now dead, lived there. So they give visitors a sense of stepping into the past. They're also really focused on these authors, taking the form of a museum that is dedicated to the writer and their associates and organized around objects that these people used and owned. Um, and I would argue that the kind of crowning jewel object is in fact the house itself. Um, this focus on material things means that the matter of the writer's work itself, which is more intangible, is generally actually sidelined in these literary heritage sites. Um, this Writer's House Museum approach is tried and tested. Alison Booth writes that it was fully established during the 19th century on her book about the history of literary tourism. However, the reading public has changed in the last 200 years. Um, and while these sites appeal to those already interested in literature or heritage more generally, they don't really bring in new audiences. Additionally, their focus on the author leaves little space for stories and literature itself. They don't really encourage reading. Dep like that's a big generalization, but I think it can be argued. Um, and whilst they offer some of the same imaginative escapism as reading through that kind of stepping into the past feel, it's only within the house itself. So their escapism is limited to domestic settings from the past, not necessarily the best worlds to escape into. Um, the reason that so many literary heritage sites stick to these kind of tried and tested forms is because there's a real investment in authenticity, which Hop and Brown and Powell describe as the reality of the places the visitor imagined it. A literary heritage site is expected to evoke the past, which is conjured through the presentation of authentic objects or the building appearing, appearing period accurate. However, scholars like Booth and David Herbert point out that the very act of creating a satisfactory heritage site is inauthentic, which can be illustrated by the Dickens Museum in London, which has been remodeled several times to adhere to a general image of Victorian England, rather than depict the building as it actually was when Dickens lived there, which has been commented on as being not Victorian enough. So authenticity in literary heritage sites isn't really about reproducing the real past, but instead evoking an accurate feeling, feeling of it. Um, this isn't a criticism of literary heritage sites, but it is a statement of fact. Um, and indeed, this kind of inauthentic approach actually, I think, suits literature, where, to paraphrase Mike Robinson, reality is distorted, um, be it through fiction or imperfect retellings of real events. Meanwhile, the digital and digital technology has been long kept out of, of heritage sites because it is seen as inauthentic. Oh, this is pretty understandable. I mean, like a touch screen in a period room is going to be instantly modernizing and take you out of that sense of step into the past. However, if we uncouple the association between literary heritage sites and this need to create an authentic sense of the past, we can start asking what the digital can do. And I think it's particularly suited to exploring and interpreting the literature itself. Digital object work has made it clear that heritage doesn't have to be strictly material. Julia Flanders writes that museum collections are now understood as informational rather than physical. 
heritage sites have become custodians of information and providers of interpretation first and foremost. Put another way, they have become storytellers. Meanwhile, literary heritage is, at its core, immaterial. There are thousands of copies of any given book, but that doesn't make an individual encounter with one any less impactful or personal. The work's aura doesn't depend on its edition. Literature and digital therefore share a mutual intangibility. So whilst the digital may disrupt the traditional author-focused approach of literary heritage sites, I do think it's uniquely able to capture the appeal of reading when employed in creative and interesting ways. Before I answer the question on this slide, what does the digital offer? I want to note that there's a lot of forms that digital technology can take, and they don't have to be intrusive or visual. Um, think, for instance, of audio guides or even just ambient audio, which can really kind of transform a space. Um, anyway, obviously, I have limited time, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, but I will summarize, I think, some of the main benefits that digital can bring to literary heritage sites. Um, the digital is informative. One screen can hold many times the amount and types of interpretation of a label the same size and give the visitor a choice of paths to explore. Pictured on the slide it is a display in the Elizabeth Gaskell House in Manchester. Um, it's a touch screen which featured scanned images of a short story in multiple forms from Gaskell's manuscript through to its published edition. This allowed people to engage with the story both as an object and to sit down and actually read it um, in greater detail than usually would be facilitated by literary heritage sites where things are kept behind glass and you're encouraged to keep moving through the space. Um, the digital was adaptable. New information can be integrated into permanent displays regularly by updating the kind of database behind the scene without needing to create whole new displays, which reflects an ever-changing literary scene allowing living authors um, and underrepresented authors to really get their due. Um, and finally, and perhaps this is the most prominent benefit of the digital, it's imaginative. Fun, creative and artistic displays can evoke the past or let you step into a fantasy, something entirely new, um, bringing the escapist joys of reading into a real physical space. Again, the example on the slide from the British Library's Paddington exhibition um, allowed you to sit down with Paddington there and watch breakfast play out around you, which gives visitors a real sense of the tone and the fun of the books, but it's engaging whether you've read them or not. Um, it's rewarding if you've read them, you can recognize the various members of the Baron family and it's exciting if you haven't read them, encouraging you to go out and explore the stories. So this has been a really quick summary. And in fact, there's like quite limited examples to pull from in literary heritage sites at the moment because the digital is currently really at its edges. Um, however, hopefully we'll see it more over the next few years um, and that my presentation has given you a sense of the possibilities and the validity of using digital technology at literary heritage sites. Um, thank you. Here's my email and my Twitter um, and a few sources I pulled from if you want to go out and read more. That's great. Thanks very much, Katrina. Um, that was uh, that was absolutely brilliant and uh, and, and well timed. So, <laughs> um, right. Well, we'll be coming back to you, I'm sure, with some some questions later on. Um, but uh, we'd better plow on uh, with our next uh, uh, speaker and our next presentation. Um, my screens are overlapping here. Uh, right. So um, next up, we have uh, Nurdan Atalan and. She's joined uh, by her colleague who won't be presenting, but will be uh, available also to uh, respond to questions, Valeria Vitale. Uh, Nerdan's from the uh, British Institute at Ankara, Valeria's from the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and Nerdan's gonna be talking to us uh, about the British International Research Institute's collaboration. The British International Research Institutes are global research partners in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. And, uh, the, uh, their main goal is to create and highlight connections uh, among different collections held in different institutions in order to enrich uh, research quality. Hello, today I would like to present 
very coordination project. I would also like to thank the conference organizers and attendees. Today, I will give you brief information about British International Resource Institutes and our project to create guidelines and templates for 8 b to combine the catalog records. One of the important things is to share our know-how. The British International Research Institutes are global research partners in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Discovering new knowledge, promoting cultural heritage, and supporting international engagement. The British are collaborating among themselves and with these cultural memory institutions to share experiences and best practice around the creation, management, and promotion of digitized collections. The main goal is to create highlight connections among different collections held in different institutions in order to, to enrich research quality. This presentation will give examples of how the British can collaborate and create digital archives, collections, and linked open data. The British International Research Institutes, BRIS, RBSA, BC, BSR, BIA, CBRL, BIPS, BC, SNS, RAST Institutes are working to, for different regions, including Italy, Greece, Turkey, and Black Sea, Levant, Libya, Iran, Iraq. Some of the institutes have archives and collections more than 100 years. Some of them already digitized their collections and publishing them online. However, some of them starting to digitize their collections. The idea is shared know-how and our practices between those institutes in the different regions on the same time and effort. This joint project shaped two years ago and started to meetings with, started to organize meetings together. Uh, now we will start from the SLS and uh, Society, uh, Society for Libyan Studies have online collections and will give clue about how uh, to share our practices about Gazette. Uh, SLS founded in 1969 and working for Libya region. Uh, they created a Gazette online archive with uh, place names. Settlement names are important for linking archival material. So SLS has experience about creating place names and Gazetteers uh, for Libya region. Very technical at Rome, working for Italy region. Online collections are available via BCR webpage. BSR used Excel for various projects and collections as a viable approach to pre-cataloging. Although this space may seem sometimes laborious and time consuming, in the long run, it turns out to be great help when it comes to understand collection from a broader point of view. In this project, there is BCR is also sharing experiences about pre-cataloging and processing about data ingestion. The CSV format can be important easily in any cataloging or metadata system, as it's con uh, considered in the lingua franca for exchanging data between different applications and databases. Heritage School at Athens working for Greece region and has online collections. The essay example seen in this slide shows the photography from Turkey, has experience with archival collections, especially for museum objects. Sharing know-how related to digital creation processes is important. The essay is also sharing experience about team management and data verification processes for digital collection. BIA, British Institute at Ankara working for Turkey and Black Sea region. Digital repository system created as Islander eight system chosen. Open access digital repository system will be open to public soon. The BLT digital repository system has taxonomy behind the system that also has linking data and authority records. So BIA is sharing uh, experience about authority, authority records and terminology showing place names uh, for Turkey region. CBRL is partner of MADIC project, so MADIC digital, mapping digital cultural heritage in Jordan project. British Institute in Eastern Africa image archive is available via archaeology data service repository. So some kind of, at some point, ADS will be given advice for this project. So far, unnoted, far more connectivity than expected between people and places across, across time as well as collections. In this slide, you see the British school uh, at Rome examples, e.g. Eugenia Sellers Strong was the first female student at the BSA in 1890-91, then became librarian and assistant director at BSR 1909-1925. Lady Alban Brogan served at BCR Faculty of Archaeology, History, and Letters Secretary, and was deeply involved with SLS. 
So this picture shows the relation between places, persons, and institutes. Each institute has some kind of connections and relations. Is Joyce Reynolds, 1918, has worked in Libya, Italy, and Turkey. Institutes started to share their data set for people and places in the beginning. With this project linked open data set for persons and places will be discussed and how are we going to create a joint data set for different regions. PI is partner for CETA project and associate partner of Ariadne Plus, uh, translated the fair, fair, fair FAIR guidelines into Turkish to increase the knowledge and awareness about FAIR for archaeological data in Turkey. Creating network and sharing know-how is important for digital creation processes. So each institute has several experience about digitalization and digital creation processes. Some institutes are also partners of international projects. Institutes can learn from each other and can same time, save time and effort. Um, those we have same people and same place information. So data sets creation for people and settlements will be important. So we don't need to create same information again and again. It is self-evident that building a community where both knowledge of the collections and technical expertise is shared and creating virtual union of our collections will create an unrivaled digital gateway, such as the pioneering impact of the work of these archaeologists and so meticulous their observation and assembly of a documentary and photographic record. These, these resources are internationally important. We have very limited time and we can learn from each other. So our aim is to talk the same language with using same standards and same vocabularies with different language. Uh, so we want to create workflows and guidelines. We want to work together. Uh, and then we want to create a linked open data set for person and places. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nerdan. That was uh, a, a, a really good um, yeah, and enlightening um, uh, yes, um, demonstration of uh, good collaboration. Thank you. Um, right, uh, we'll, we'll carry on. We'll go to our, our third talk now. Um, the next up, we have uh, Maya Dodd, who's from uh, Flame University in India. And uh, Maya uh, received her PhD from Stanford University and subsequent postdoctoral fellowships at the Committee for South Asian Studies at Princeton University uh, and at the Center for Law and Governance in JNU, India. I hope that's right, Maya. Um, <laughs> and uh, yes, uh, Maya's going to be talking, uh, her title of her talk is uh, What's Missing Digital Humanities and Critical Infrastructure in, in India. So uh, I will hand over to you, Maya, and I will. Myself. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. I hope everything is visible. Yeah. Oh, great. Yes, it is. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, just to describe myself, I'm a 40 something brown woman of South Asian descent, uh, wearing earrings and have my hair pulled back. Currently, I'm speaking from Pune in Western India, and it's raining pretty heavily here. So where I locate my question comes also from where I'm situated. Uh, and just because it's supposed to be a speedy presentation, I want to put at the very front the question I'm asking, which is that I located, uh, I locate the sort of querying around digitized collections uh, to the point of how we narrate archives in contemporary terms for individuals and for institutions. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I'm just going to sorry minimize myself yeah thank you <laughs> all right so you know the term digital humanities has come to mean many things but the point that this talk will make is that a lot of very interesting work is happening with digital humanities outside of um, you know higher educational institutions and actually even outside of institutions altogether uh and there is something you know that the conversation about the digital divide occludes which is that there is this sort of explosion of expressiveness uh, taking place in many, many registers. And I think the point now is to look at those registers to see what comes out of the creation of these smaller voices, uh, smaller archival efforts, and also in terms of these registers of contemporary archiving. So very simply put, you know, digital humanities in India is very different 
from the university spaces of its practice in the global north. Uh, there, there's the imagination of a digital humanities laboratory, many tools, many resources. Uh, whereas in the Indian sort of uh, site, there are many practices on the ground, even if the university system in some senses is not really the site of that activity. Um, to understand that India is the youngest country in the world, poised, it seems, at becoming the world's largest by next year, is to really wonder at what the digital means for this population. Since 20 universities at the time of independence, today the total count is about 1,000. And I mention this because higher education is linked to the idea of aspiration and capacity. Uh, the numbers I mention are to indicate that obviously this university system is far from adequate to capturing aspiration and expression. And this is why we need to look at sort of what exists outside of these institutional spaces that are the sanctioned spaces of knowledge making and archival creation. Yeah, so this is a slide and I know I'm supposed to be speedy. So this is a very quick snapshot at all kinds of efforts that have existed in terms of digitizing archival uh, data and collections. And obviously there have been initially government uh, sort of sanctioned projects where government institutions digitize their holdings. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, you also see the rise now of crowdsourced and sort of other private players in the space. Now, I want to sort of mention that the computational tradition in this sense is going back to two big historical projects. One was Project Madurai, which was a digitized collection of ancient Tamil classics. And the other was Bichitra, which was a digital verorium of Rabindranath Tagore's works. Now, the thing is, since then, it's surprising that there have been very few digital humanities or digitized projects coming out of these institutional spaces. Uh, I mentioned, of course, the Digital Library, National Digital Library of India, NDLI, uh, the Digital Archive of the National Archives of India, Abhilek Patal, and other digital databases like Ideas of India as notable exceptions. But actually, it's the absence of these infrastructures which challenges how sort of, uh, you know, these other sort of spaces have given rise to some answers. And had we a project like the Australian one, Trove, where crowdsourcing and participation were encouraged in a Wikipedia sort of format, perhaps they would be a very different story. But in any case, the point here is not that this is exhaustive of the imagination of how people are narrating right historical memory. And I'm listing here, because I'm supposed to be quick, uh, just the names of some of these efforts, which I really invite folks to take a look at. And they range from sort of literally the small, the medium and the large, nothing quite on the scale or the sort of the, uh, you know, the, the corpus of uh, resource that uh, Bichitra or even other government sort of initiatives might have had. But in any case, literally uh, single individuals, certain collectives have managed to sort of draw attention on the things they deem important. So if you look at, for instance, um, you know, Kamra, which is a queer archive coming out of a lawyer's collective that was sort of, you know, amassing this material when you uh, this has now made its way uh, to the National Law School Library in Bangalore. And what I was sort of uh, mentioning in this case is that, yes, there is the question of what happens to some of these digital archives after individuals have moved on or after, uh, you know, we, they need new custodians. So in some sense, uh, as many of these are taking place outside of the university or governmental infrastructures, uh, these uh, experiments are altering the way in which we understand who's documenting, uh, who is this for, and the overall sort of understanding of publication and access to knowledge. So in classrooms in India, some of us are, you know, experiencing the power of this in terms of multiplying access. And we're also witnessing the rise of crowdsourcing and pure enabled creation. Uh, which in a way is complicating the idea of authority. Uh, some of these sort of stories we collected in this book, which is now two or three years old, but uh, in fact, at that point, there was still a focus on what are institutions doing. And post, I think, COVID and the rise of so many new voices, the recognition is that there is a lot of exciting activity happening, of course, you know, in terms of social media and other sort of handles, but really in terms of pr quieter private efforts uh, to sort of, you know, uh, create these resources. So this anthology explored the turn to digital across institutions such as the National Museum and things like even Asia Art Archive. Uh, but the next sort of reflection I invite, I think, many of us to look at is the sort of dilemma, which is 
on the one hand, we see, you know, individual efforts to doing this or, you know, private efforts to doing this, but really how do we amplify those? And is that not a question of infrastructure where the amplification would mean that more digital archives can serve their publics? Um, this is, uh, you know, what I sort of list very quickly as what might be possible, what can be done. Uh, and of course, some of us in universities are attempting to push this through digital humanities courses. But really, it is the classic, you know, public private partnership model that I imagine would take the story forward, which is that you need sort of co creation, but then you also need uh, some amount of heavy lifting to amplify and to sort of build infrastructure to actually sort of get word out there in terms of the wonderful work done by so many uh, in terms of generating this work and cataloging it. And more importantly, as somebody mentioned earlier, the point really with all of this is to tell new stories and to sort of not just tell dominant stories. So in that sense, the multilingual sort of uh, subscript to many of this is critical. And that is something the digital makes uniquely possible uh, where you know we are able now to perhaps render this uh, in a multi-channel fashion, that was not always the story with traditional archiving. So I will end here and I hopefully have not exceeded my time. Thank you. If you have any questions, this is my Twitter handle and that's my email. Thanks. Oh, that was brilliant, Maya. Thank you so much. It was uh, finally timed. Um, yeah, very interesting to hear about the, just the scale. I think I heard you mention a thousand universities in India. And uh, yes, we're- Hopefully uh, short though. <laughs> what's that? Mostly short of meeting the you know demographic need. So oh, oh, right. <laughs> yes. okay. yeah, we, we, we think we have a complicated landscape here in the UK with 165 universities, but you know, yeah, we, we, we might return to that idea of scale at the end in the questions. Yeah. I would be interested to hear more about that. But thank you ever so much. That was great. Really interesting. Um, I'll uh, now press on to the uh, fourth and last of our uh, speed presentations. Um, next up, we have um, Ker Liu, and she's from uh, the Renmin University of China. Um, and Ker Liu is going to be talking to us about um, artificial intelligence and archives management. Uh, looking forward to that. So uh, AI has been the mainstream in recent 10 years. Um, and uh, so Ker Liu is going to... Uh, propose how the archives apply artificial intelligence work from the layer of mind, resource and technology. And uh, so, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now and hand over to you, Curly. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Curly. Um, I'm a Chinese girl uh, with a black hair, green shirt, green glasses. And uh, I'm coming from Shanghai, Renmin University of China and uh, a second year PhD candidate. And uh, today I'm really happy to see you guys and uh, I'm gonna talk about artificial intelligence and uh, archives management. Okay, uh, first I want to introduce some of uh, the general situation of artificial intelligence in China. Uh, you know, in 2017, uh, the State Council has issued a new generation of artificial intelligence development plan. And last year, the China uh, Internet, uh, Internet Society of China has released the China Internet Report. And it was clear that AI industry has reached the 300 billion, over 300 billion RMB. And I want to mention that the way the World Artificial Intelligence Conference. And we held it every year starting from 20, uh, 2018, and which gathered a lot of scientists and uh, entrepreneurs to, uh, to make some uh, communication with each other and talk about some uh, you know, hot issues or some uh, future work in field of AI and uh, to build a, a platform for them to communicate. And um, uh, why we need to apply AI in archives management? The one thing is that the digital and born digital records are increasing. And uh, other things is that uh, archives management is expected to be intelligent, personalized and knowledge-based. You know, uh, last year on um, our National Archives so Next Five Strategy Plan, and we make a lot of goals 
And one of the goals is that the new generation of information technology is more widely used in archive work. And I had made a review um, based on CNKI, which is the biggest uh, Chinese uh, periodical database. And we can find that so since the 2017, and our uh, archival community has began to focus on the AI and the archives work. And as for the content, um, the, we divided it into two parts. And uh, one aspect is the theory, uh, theoretical uh, consideration. And uh, the second one is the specific solutions and for some certain archives management. And our National Archives Administration has uh, supported a lot of uh, projects every year. Um, for uh, um, to make a, comp a cooperation, cooperation between university and uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, here are some projects related to um, AI and the archives work. I, and then here I want to show uh, two interesting cases. And one case is that the Taiwan uh, Digital History library and this is a typical line date of Taiwan and they um, provide the tour kit to public and using AI technology to identify and uh, extract the information like date, price and the name of seller, buyer to uh, and make them relationship to other documentations for the user to make the more uh, better understand for the content. And uh, other case is uh, Da Xunfei, it's a Chinese AI company. And uh, he make a lot of work like uh, intelligence archiving, visual um, analysis, image recognitions, and uh, they also do a lot of work like uh, oral history project to uh, build a corpus like this. And uh, by comparing the debates and the practice between China and the foreign countries, I, I found that things are totally different. And using the uh, re records continuum model proposed by Frank Upward, and we can find that the, you know, uh, the discussion in foreign countries like UK or USA um, involves a full life cycle of re records concurring all four dimensions. But in China, it's mainly uh, to talk about how to use AI technology to develop the historical archive resources. So it's different stage. And I put forward six directions and I want to mention the intelligence searching. You know, in China, we, uh, our archivals always provide the ritual items such as uh, title, author, and uh, uh, the field numbers to for them to search what they want to need. And, but it's really hard for them to, to find something when uh, the user didn't have a clear purpose. So we need to use AI technologies to help them to uh, find what they need and get the direct answers. And how to apply AI in archives work? Uh, I think we have a lot of work to do from mind resource and technology. You know, um, for some people, it's really hard to accept uh, AI because they, they didn't tr trust them. And uh, the, digi the resource digitalization is very hard and the financial and the human cost is very high. So we need to do a lot for them to use the AI technologies in archives work. So uh, that's all I want to share. And if you are interested in it or you have some questions, you can email me. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Kilyu. It's uh, a fascinating quick glimpse at uh, the area of work that you're looking at there. Um, so that's um, all of the, the session, all the presentations uh, in this session that we've uh, gone through now. Um, please. Do uh, put any questions, any thoughts, or even comments that uh, reflections that occur to you uh, listening to any of that uh, in, in the Q and A. We'd love to hear from you. 
Um, can I invite uh, all of our speakers now to turn their cameras back on so we'll all get together uh, as a panel. So we've got um, a little bit more time uh, in this session to, uh, to reflect on what we've just seen and heard. So uh, and thank you once again to, to all of you and uh, welcome Valeria on screen, who's a uh, colleague of Nerdans, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so we, um, we'll, uh, no questions coming in at the moment, um, but uh, perhaps people are still thinking, considering. Um, I was reflecting on all of your presentations and uh, there seemed to me to be uh, kind of, well, firstly, we're a very international um, uh, bunch <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's really good and reflective, I think, of the aspirations of DCDC as a conference in order to uh, try and um, work internationally and collaborate. And so, but it's that theme of collaboration that came through quite strongly for me uh, in, in, in aspects of all of your talks, I think. Um, I was, I guess, maybe the first thing to perhaps put to all of you would be on that on that theme of collaboration, um, either explicitly with, with your talk, Nerdan, across the uh, all of the VR, VIRIs, but also uh, with you, Maya, in terms of the, the scale of your work in, in India, uh, Katrina, um, collaboration between cultural heritage and, and maybe technology providers. Uh, and could you, um, you know, kind of again collaboration perhaps with with AI experts and, and the application to, to archives and maybe archives working together. Um, question to all of you: What would make what what single thing would make your lives easier in terms of uh, being able to collaborate more effectively? Anybody want to come in on that? Ah, my yeah, I'll, first. I'll okay, go in my. first. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think because, uh, you know, I'm interested in the question of how we can amplify and build more capacity. And for that, you know, discoverability is extremely important. There isn't a single platform of any variety that allows that to happen. And I'm talking about sort of small archives and, you know, sort of all kinds of actors in that, uh, but also sort of the linked data, you know, that we need for things to talk to each other. Uh, if it resided in a platform that enabled discoverability, I think it would go a long way for people to understand what else is happening elsewhere and how to find it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, very appropriate for the DCDC uh, theme as well. So thank you very much for picking up on that. But yeah, um, uh, discoverability is extremely important across collections. Uh, anybody else want to come in with, with thoughts on their... Uh, they're, they're the one thing that would make their lives easier in terms of collaboration. I think uh, communication and increased knowledge between um, all kinds of specialists and uh, directors and the library managers and administrator level, because sometimes it is very technical. We are speaking very technical to open those collections and everything, but uh, it's very difficult to explain to other people what we need. Uh, so the communication is important. And so we are talking about linked open data as a technical level, but what is this linked open data? Why we need, because uh, so in Turkey, for example, um, li lots of libraries, archives, and museums are struggling with um, this sharing collections and creating standards or uh, applying these standards. So I think it is important to communicate each other with all levels uh, while we are doing these collaborative activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Yes. Uh, uh, I do. Communication is uh, between uh, yeah different groups uh, doing different things. It's um, yeah absolutely key. Um, okay, uh, I can go on to some uh, questions from our audience now. There's uh, some have appeared in the Q and A box. Um, so let me start with um, a question to you, Katrina, if I may. Um, it uh, regards the balance between uh, fictionality and authenticity in the discussed heritage sites. 
Do you think digital can help to signal that level of authenticity that might otherwise be lost when tweaking the exhibits towards public perception or public expectation? Yeah, um, I do. I think like if the kind of feeling of the digital remains that is like implicitly inauthentic, I think that in itself is almost like a form of authenticity. Um, if that's um, kind of what you're asking, as like as I understand the question, like um, having the kind of digital there, like plays into the kind of fictionality of the space, which then kind of allows the fictionality of the stories to be given a much more prominent role. I also think that you know specific types of technology do really have kind of the capacity to signal kind of a more authentic connection with the past because they don't have to rely on physical objects so I'm thinking um for instance like the capacity to kind of reconstruct places through time as they existed so like obviously heritage sites as they exist have to kind of pick a period to focus on and recreate but the capacity of digital to kind of model different periods then allows it to kind of gesture to how a site changes over time which is surely kind of a equally accurate representation of how it exists um, and has existed um, kind of changes surely the ongoing similarity or oh, ongoing um, consistent mm -hmm. factor through time um, yeah thank you yes yes no thanks for those reflections um, so uh, there is another question before you, uh, Katrina, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to somebody else first and then come back to you, if I may. Um, so a uh, question from my colleague, Peter Finley, uh, to Maya. Um, so Maya, could you suggest what kind of infrastructure might help to achieve some level of long-term sustainability for projects? Any ideas on, any reflections on that? What kind yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think we forget that the digital is ephemeral often, and it feels like, you know, if there's a website up, it'll, it'll, it should be there for all time. But the truth is that it requires, and I know, for instance, Internet Archive or other such uh, sort of fora do web scraping, and there is some kind of preservation that is ongoing. But really, I think it is that if one lone soldier has started an effort and sort of on their own dime, keep something going for a bit, the expectation that that will be enough or that will uh, continue forever or something is what I think we need to be cautious against. So when I say long-term sustainability, I think there is a model of adoption and I'm not sure exactly i mean this is a tough one because it's it's a funding question really uh i think we are getting used to being disappointed by not having big funding in india for humanities projects so we don't really have that kind of a you know melon foundation and national endowment for the humanities kind of money uh that can be tapped into to do that kind of work but uh there really does need to be thought on the digital preservation and also the sort of subsequent adoption of these efforts. I wish I had a more robust answer, but one of the reasons I did not actually mention many uh, voices in the social media space is because they're even more ephemeral, like at least with some sort of digital archival uh, creations, there is a sort of eye to the longer term uh, but with very very uh what do you say viral social media handles also and they create a lot of buzz and there's a lot of interest around those uh handles the fact is that you know they could be shut down tomorrow they could be you know completely disappeared uh and so i think i'm sort of focused on the question of digital archiving uh from a semi-institutional point of view at least uh aware of the fact that the answer is not in terms of state funding now, what is that third space? I wish I knew, but yeah, something mm -hmm. that needs to be thought through. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, uh, I was, it occurred to me whilst you were talking, and you mentioned crowdsourcing, and, and crowdsourcing uh, presumably has opportunities uh, at a scale of uh, India that you were talking about that, that perhaps uh, aren't available to people working elsewhere. I don't know, but it's intriguing in, in terms of that scale you were talking about. 
Anyway, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, there's there's another question if you might have um, in in the Q and A, but um, I'll I'll put one to uh, Kaloon um, if I may, and maybe come back to you. Um, so uh, Kaloon, uh, the question here: Could you could you give us some specific examples of um, how AI has been successfully or or unsuccessfully used in archival work? Um, um, our, our participant here has added a note. I feel the technology is often related to hype and expectations and doesn't always deliver on the hopes and expectations promised. So um, that's an interesting view she has been added there. But uh, do you have any uh, examples you might be able to give us? Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, as for I mentioned before, and uh, you know, in China, a lot of uh, national archives always uh, use the AI technologies to uh, identify, use the QR code to identify and uh, extra, uh, extract the Chinese character. So it's really hard for the archivist to recognize. So it's really helpful. But, um, but you know, AI technology is not widely expected to public. It has a lot of reasons. You know, in China, in national situation, we uh, have a lot of archivists uh, with uh, uh, archival science degree, and we don't have too much technology skills. So they don't want to um, um, when we use the AI technology in archives work, maybe they think uh, they have um, did, they didn't have too much advantages. They will um, replace the by AI technology. So it's very hard for us to accept. And uh, I think AI technology is uh, is a trade for archival work, but we need uh, to do a lot of things to tackle some problems for for example like like the mind like the user because the user thinks that you use the R AI technology and my data privacy will be um will be destroyed and my data of my personality is uh stole by others and used by others so we have a lot to do thank you mm. Yes, just kind of handling expectations and uh, ideas of uh, a threat and concern is, uh, is, is, is a job in itself. Yeah, I, I did notice, Curly, that um, that list of projects you put up, some of them were dated and uh, some, uh, some, some of those later projects were, were going all the way out to 2027. So presumably quite big, substantial um, pieces of work going on there. I mean, in terms of, is it easy for archives to, to get funding and uh, find collaborations in this area? Um, actually, we can get some fund for the National Archival Administration because, you know, as for, as I mentioned before, we have uh, put forward uh, uh, our next five years strategies. So we really put more attention and money on it. So we can seek so collaborations with the university teachers, or some interpreters to get more communication and to find the some solutions for AI in archives work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, to Katrina again, if I may. Um, this uh, another question for Katrina. Do you expect to see any of these literary spaces you've looked at taken into? Uh, the digital space in the near future, and which one would you most want to see digitized? Um, okay, yeah. Um, so definitely, it needs to be acknowledged that um, that's already beginning to happen. So even like kind of the example says in the presentation, the uh, Charles Dickens Museum in London is kind of already visible on their website in um, like a Google Arts kind of way, where you like move through it as you would on Street View. Um, so you can kind of virtually visit the museum. Um, and then the Alice in Wonderland exhibition at the V&A had like a VR component to it. So it was a VR game. You need the headset and everything. 
um, which you could play as part of the exhibition, but you actually could also download at home. And what that was, was it kind of took you through a virtual, like cartoonized version of the V&A building, um, which was populated by various characters from Alice in Wonderland. Um, so it was rooted in the V&A, but took this much more creative approach and really kind of engaged with the story itself, um, which I think is like really interesting. Um, in terms of the uh, sites I would love to see digitized, um, I think that the Bronte Parsonage, as it is, um, isn't doing stuff with digital stuff so much, but has a really, really interesting art program. And I'd be interested to see how they could kind of use digital art um, and extend that. So it isn't simply a case like at the VA, um, it isn't just kind of digitizing the space, but it is in fact um, kind of taking that a step further. Um, I think the artwork stuff they do at the Bronte Parsonage is really interesting in terms of interpretation because it kind of does play with like different interpretations and opinions. And so I think that they would be able to do something really interesting with that digitization kind of if the right mm. things came together. Mm. Okay, that sounds intriguing. Um, uh, I wonder if they're here at the DCDC conference. Maybe they're, maybe they're listening to that and give, give them some ideas. Um, yes, and my, my kids, uh, obviously being based here in London, they've uh, went on school trips to the Dickens Museum, so uh, yeah, possibilities there. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yes. Um, back to, to Maya again. Question, another question for you. Um, we've got about seven minutes left, so time for a couple more questions. Um, you mentioned public-private partnerships as a way of facilitating creation and longevity of smaller community-based archives. Does this assume a commercial product uh, coming from the academic sector? Uh, this is the norm for us as a consumer. Oh, sorry. Yeah. This, the person is saying from the academic, they're from the academic sector, so they're assuming it would be a commercial product. Uh, is there tension here between the interests of partners, the private and the community from which the material came in terms of post-digital access? And how might this be resolved? Yeah. So I wish I had a way to sort of not make this point so bold, but the truth is that we're really, really... Uh, how, like short on resource, even in the university system. So even a product like Gale Sengage, something, you know, most universities can't afford. And so in one sense, our default go-to anyway is open source, open access, uh, you know, in, in, and I, I don't mean everything has to be pro bono because somebody is bearing the cost, no doubt. But uh, yeah, when we say public private, what I think we mean also is that heritage often can be perceived as a public good. And you can't really privatize that, but you might need private investment to kind of make that heritage, whatever format, right, more public. Uh, that being said, I'm also aware of very troubled histories and, you know, exploitative relationships often uh, that have, you know, marked that. So there is no doubt uh, the awareness of differential access. Uh, and I don't mean that in terms of a paid model of who can afford and who can't afford, but really in terms of how far people wish to participate. Uh, so there are sort of two things which flank it. One is sort of the need for much more uh, open access and open source. Uh, but there's also the recognition that it should be on the terms that people wish to participate with it. So it sounds a little abstract maybe, but uh, yeah, but the, I think we're still figuring these models out. And one is of course the people go where the money is and there is a lot more private money in India than there used to be. So we're living at that point, that inflection point where, you know, state support is no longer the thing to look at. But of course, private money comes, you know, with terms and conditions. So I think many countries are sort of figuring this out at the same time. But yeah, this is a yeah. <laughs> Yes, thanks for that. That's a nuanced answer. Um, I'd, I'd like to put a question to Nerdan and Valeria, if I may. And um, since in the, uh, I was very struck by um, all of the different ways that your institutions are collaborating together. Um, uh, and, you know, you talked about vocabularies and infrastructure and language and workflows. Um, 
and you know, and the linked open data that you're working towards as well. I mean, I, I would imagine that's a, an absolutely key um, part of your strategy going forwards in terms of your collaboration. I mean, how how would you characterize your progress in that area of linked open data? Is that a, quite a mature activity that you've got going there? Or have you got a long way to go yet? No. Uh, Do you want me to answer that? Uh, sure. Shall I start? Okay. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for thank you for the question. Um, it is a key component, and uh, about the question that you asked before, what would make your life easier? I think that using standards uh, would be my first um, uh, my first you know uh, bullet point on the list. And I think the linked open data it's uh, it's a great choice for a standard that can be understood by a number of applications, a number of you know infrastructures. Um, and it's not um, software specific. So because all the uh, British um, research institutes, international research institutes are so different and they are at such a different stages in their you know, digitization process and you know, opening up uh, processes, I think that the idea of investing in linked open data was um, you know, was, was really a key, was really, uh, you know, a, uh, let's say a, a way, a, an, an, an experiment in linking things that are different, but that can talk to each other. I don't know if Nurdan wants to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with Valeria because we have different institutes in different regions. So we have same kind of materials, but we have different types of places, different names of places and with Turkish, Arabic and other languages. So we have so many differences between. So if we can create a linked open data infrastructure between these institutes, so it will be a way to communicate and talk each other. Uh, so we don't need to create uh, the same because we have also shared archives. So one person located many archives in different places. So we have same photographs, same same kind of photographs from same places, etc. So it's important to create this linked open data infrastructure for us. Mm. So and in terms of its maturity, I mean, how would you characterize it as, you know, what progress have you made and how far have you got to go in that, in that area? Well, it depends because each, uh, each of the institutes uh, has a different let's say, stage of maturity. Okay. Um, so there are some of them that are, uh, you know, uh, really quite, uh, quite ready to go. Mm. Uh, and some others that will definitely take some time. And the project that we've done presented is actually a scoping project at the okay, moment, right. just to, you know, clarify what we need, what are the strategic steps that we need to take to have sure. all of them uh, be part of it because if we had only considered you know those institutes like the one in in Turkey and you know a few others that are really advanced we could be ready to go now but because we wanted all the institutes to be part of it so that we do it only once and not uh, you know many times uh, we we combined this effort with uh, some sort of you know leveling up of uh, the various institutes, which I think is going to pay off in the in the long term. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, so we're at eleven o'clock, but uh, I don't. That we, that there's nothing coming straight after this, and we've got one more question in the Q and A. So uh, if you're prepared to hang, stay on for a, a minute or two longer, um, it's actually to um, uh, call you uh, again, if I may. So. AI, it's a question from, from Ellie Michaela Young. AI technologies are known to be inherently biased. So is it possible to offset these biases? It's a, it's a very big question to, to end on, but perhaps uh, you may have some thoughts on that. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. And I think that uh, AI technologies is, is, uh, will cause the, the, a lot of digital divides and the information gap between, you know, like the young and the old. So the gap is going to get bigger and bigger. So I think um, it cannot, uh, the bias cannot disappear. So what we do is that to help understand the, the 
the needs of the vulnerable people and the bridge the gap and create some rules to protect the, their their rights. So, but I think that uh, um, the virus cannot disappear because it is determined by technology itself. Mm. Yeah, thank you.